All right, I think we can call the uh, 23rd meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to order. It's 1 o'clock. Uh, well, welcome and greetings to uh, those of you who are here and those of you who are watching on the web as well. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the meeting of August 8 and August 14. Those meetings, uh, those minutes, I should say, uh, have not yet been prepared. I was on vacation last week and did not, uh, have not yet prepared them, so we'll defer that item till the next meeting. The August 8 meeting was a brief public meeting that we had out of our very successful uh, Western Massachusetts Forum. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the August 14 minutes were the minutes of last week's meeting. The transcripts of both of those meetings are up on our website, so the full transcript is there for those who wish to see what, uh, what took place. And as I say, the minutes will follow uh, for next week. Uh, that will take us to the third item on the agenda, which has a number of subparts, the first of which is the executive director search update. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, do you have some updates for us on that? Sure. We have, uh, as, as you both know, we hired uh, jury staff out of the Philadelphia area to uh, assist us with the executive director search. Uh, they are culling candidates. I've had a chance to speak with a few of them already over the phone to do an initial interview. Uh, the next step would be, uh, once we are past these initial phone interviews, to invite uh, potential candidates to, to Boston for some more uh, thorough and specific discussions. Um, I, I do think that uh, you know, most of the candidates uh, that we've talked to so far are uh, not from Massachusetts. So I think to your point, Commissioner McHugh, you've talked about the need for us to uh, is, is we're trying to learn about them, we also need to try to make a sales pitch to them is why this is an exciting opportunity as well as a great great state to live in. So we're proceeding along those lines. Um, jury staff is sending me write-ups on potential candidates uh, a couple of week, and we're choosing to make, um, again, those initial phone call interviews, and then uh, from that group we'll invite a handful to Boston. And we decided last week that the posting would remain open until September 7. Is that the, yes. that the target date that we're using? Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, well, that's great. Then we'll, we'll uh, uh, proceed to, to get some good candidates and, and do a sales pitch as, as uh, convince them just to, uh, to join us here. All right. Uh, anything else on that uh, item? Um, so let's go then to the additional hires. We have other hires in addition to the executive director. That's the, that's the, uh, the main uh, one we're looking at. But the general counsel, staff attorney, and deputy director of the Investigation and Enforcement Bureau, speaking about the first two, general counsel and staff attorney, uh, I ought to split those in half. The general counsel will be posted, I hope, uh, by early next week. I'm in the process of drafting a job description, which we'll have to approve. Uh, no doubt at the next meeting, um, and then we'll be able to post that sometime next week. That's a, a critically important uh, component of the team. Uh, the staff attorney um, uh, search is well underway, and jury staff is handling that as well. I've gotten five resumes and summaries that have been filtered through jury staff now, and anticipate getting five more to, by tomorrow. So I'll have a total of 10 and then we can process those uh, quickly, and I hope uh, have somebody on board uh, in the very near future. Of course, that person, whoever we select as a finalist, will have to pass the background investigation and uh, that uh, everybody else has to, has to uh, pass. In addition to that, we're contemplating uh, hiring um, or inquiring about the possibility of hiring some uh, legal support in the form of perhaps a paralegal and perhaps some others um, who uh, who could help us both with the regulations and with the racing issues and with other things that we're, we're attempting to do. So that's where we are on the legal side. Uh, the Deputy Director of the IEB, uh, Commissioner Cameron. I can speak to that, Commissioner McHugh. Um, just completing a, a job description for that 
for that position. I've had extensive conversations with our gaming consultants and others about the skill sets we're looking for in that particular position. Um, I think uh, in a similar mode, we should be able to discuss and finalize the description next week and, and also post that position. Right. Anything you want to uh, would like to add, Commissioner, to that? I should note, uh, as is obvious uh, now that I, I think about it, uh, that uh, Commissioner Zuniga and uh, Chairman Crosby are not present uh, today. Both are out of town, uh, and uh, so the quorum is meeting without them, and they'll be back at the, at the meeting next week. Um, okay, uh, item 3C is discussion of internal policies. There was a broad discussion last week. I don't know that there's anything that the three of us can add to that discussion. Uh, I know that Commissioner Zuniga is undertaking some revisions in light of that discussion and we'll come back with the final version or at least another draft of the internal policies in the near future in light of, of uh, uh, those uh, in light of those comments from last week. Um, so that takes us to item 3D, which is the report from the Director of Administration. This is uh, Director Eileen Glovsky's first uh, report, and uh, uh, she's been here now for almost a month and uh, doing a terrific job helping us stay organized and uh, on track on a variety of different, uh, in a variety of different tracks. Well, in the interest of brevity, I won't go over everything I've done over the past month. Sure. I'd really like to talk about where I am now and what's happening going forward. Um, we do have one procurement uh, that is out for the brand identity and website information that I know that Director Driscoll has spoken about in the past. The final date for receiving submissions for that is tomorrow, August 22nd at 5 p.m. Once that we receive those in, we will sort of commence reviewing the uh, things that, submissions that we've gotten and move forward. Um, I think that we're looking at uh, our time schedule is making, um, commenting on, on the apparent successful winner of that procurement on September 4th. Um, I did want, uh, we are looking at the RFI draft. A draft has been put together and our expectation is that um, we'll have probably additional conversation about that uh, next week, but there is a, a very solid draft for the RFI research agenda um, that we're looking forward to putting out, which I think will really be beneficial to the commission in getting the information necessary to move forward um, with determining how best to do the research that is stipulated in the statute. For those who are unfamiliar with the terminology, and the RFI is a request for information, yes. and we're looking for information about how to proceed, essentially. Uh, yes. Or plans for proceed, approaches yes. to doing There's a, a lot of things that the commission need, is responsible for based on the statute, um, but the best way to get that information and to make sure that we have raw data to continue lo longitudinal studies as we go forward um, is something that we need additional information on. Um, right. in order to determine how, how we'll move forward. So an RFI is something that's uh, typically done in order to have, you know, people who might potentially do the, do the research or academicians who are familiar with it to offer their comments to, to assist us in making the decisions on moving forward. Great. Um, the certification forms that uh, we released uh, a week or so ago that seemed to come with $400,000 um, in checks, I just wanted to reiterate that it is the position of the Commission at this point in time that we need original documents in our hand before a check will be accepted or before wiring instructions will be provided. There's a lot of information on that certification form that needs to be filled out appropriately and we're most comfortable verifying that it has been done so with a wet signature prior to accepting any funds. Uh, there is a meeting tomorrow that I'm really looking forward to that will be with the gaming consultants and our project management consultants. It's a big part of what I know that I was brought in to, to work on and we're going to really be at a place where we can start to coordinate um, a visual view of how we're going to be managing the process of setting up the commission and all the things that the commission has to do. I think when we think about project management, generally we think about a very specific project, you know, getting the regulations out or 
you know, getting the applications done. And what we are looking to use the software that has been purchased, NetPoint, which I did get installed on my computer this week, is to really present something that has the potential to be a long-term, multi-year, multi-faceted view of all the things that the Commission is going to have to do over the next three to five years. Obviously, we're not going to start out with the entire breadth of that, but it will be about the continuation of standing up the Commission, of accepting applications, about making decisions with that, but we'll also be integrating into it um, hires that we expect to make so that we can make sure that we make the hires at the appropriate time to match the work that, that's going on, um, that we'll in, put in the procurements that are going to have to be done to make sure that we time the procurements appropriately. And I think that the benefit to both the Commission and the public as we move through this process will be the ability to see the whole of what has to go on. This is really trying to do a startup company but make it a Fortune 500 within 12 months. And that's not an easy task and there are many things that have to be done and the ability to map that out so that everyone can see what has to go forward I think will make the process a lot easier. And that's all that I have. Are there any questions from the Commission? No, I think that's, uh, uh, I don't have a question, but I think this piece that you've just described is something we've been trying to get from the very beginning. Uh, this is a, uh, one only has to take a look at the statute and all the responsibilities that the Commission has in order to understand how many moving parts there are and to, tr to get something that not only will help us but the public and everybody who's interested in our activities understand uh, where we are at any given moment uh, in an overall sense is uh, really very important and uh, will be a great accomplishment. So I look forward to this uh, commencement of this process tomorrow and, and the ultimate results of it. I think great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Director Glovsky's uh, report really takes care of uh, both her report and uh, item 3E, which is the project management consultant status report. That's PMA is the project uh, management consultants. They were here uh, several weeks ago to uh, give us a brief uh, demonstration, and uh, uh, they'll uh, be part of the uh, activities tomorrow as we move forward with that, with that planning process. Uh, let's turn now to the racing division, item four on the agenda, and uh, Commissioner Cameron uh, for an update and then uh, uh, discussion of where we are in the director of racing search. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I will start with the uh, Director of Racing Search. Um, as we mentioned last week, we have posted for the position, and to date we have a handful of, uh, of resumes for the position. Uh, we have posted in all the appropriate places so that we, we are casting uh, the net wide enough to, to reach all that may be interested. Um, as Commissioner Stebbins pointed out, it's. Uh, I think it's important to let people know that this is a great city and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's got a lot of value if someone were interested in coming here. Uh, we intend to keep that process open until after Labor Day, and at that time we'll be uh, starting the, the resume review. Um, uh, in addition to that, an update in general, we did have our first meeting of the racing committee, which is a legislated piece uh, and the responsibility of this committee will really be to determine the split of the monies that will be going into racing. Um, all five representatives, uh, the governor's representative, the treasurer's representative, and the two horsemen's association representative met in our office yesterday and we had initial discussions on strategy, how to accomplish this task in a, uh, in a timely manner. So we will uh, be doing some research and meeting again next month in our office. In addition, um, we did have a request. I did have hearings last week, uh, and I will be reporting on those next week and be offering some tentative decisions at that time. We also had one request for a settlement um, with regard to a previous uh, tentative decision. Um, and one request we made of, uh, of the appellant and his attorney was that we want those in writing. If we're going to consider a matter, we really need to look at the, the facts in writing. So 
we'll be extending the time frame so that they understand that they'll have enough time if they choose to uh, put something in writing or if they, cho or if they choose to um, appeal the decision. So that's, uh, that's the report on, on racing. That's the status report uh, to date. Uh, insofar as the extension is concerned, uh, Commissioner, uh, do we need a vote, uh, perhaps, uh, to ensure that the statutory deadlines are extended and that they have the additional We can time certainly do that. Do that. Uh, Commissioner McHugh, my recommendation would be that we, um, that we hold, we allow the, uh, the appellant until the 14th of September to move forward in either direction with, uh, with a written settlement offer or, um, or uh, paperwork for an appeal. Right. And I've spoken to uh, Mr. Kilb, the, uh, the, uh, the racing division staff attorney on this matter, and uh, it would be my recommendation that we uh, amend the, the 30 days and uh, provide an extra two weeks, which would take us until uh, September 14th. All right. Discussion of that uh, of that uh, motion? No, I second that motion. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion is carried. So that uh, appellant has uh, an extra uh, two weeks to uh, file uh, whatever it is that the appellant wants to file. All right. Um, The, um, the uh, director of racing uh, search will remain posted until when, did you say that? Just after Maybe? Labor Day, we're going to close that, Commissioner. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Uh, let's go then to item five on the agenda, which is the uh, project uh, work plan and the consultant's report. I see that we have uh, two of our esteemed consultants here. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, Mr. Carroll. Mr. Gushin, Robert, nice Robert Carroll, you. Fred Gushin, appearing on behalf of the consultant team. Um, by way of an update, uh, we've had uh, significant progress on a variety of different areas. Uh, we're currently, uh, we've delivered the RFA uh, phase two regulations, at least the entitled uh, uh, sections that we'll be working on to fill out the substance of those regulations. Uh, obviously, they'll be tying into the uh, phase one um, at different points, and there's additional work that uh, will be done as the process continues to roll out uh, where there's some supplement that will be necessary. But for now, we had identified those areas that we know that um, good uh, regulatory practice demand must be included in this phase. Uh, secondly, uh, we're working on a number of items uh, that really are part of the strategic uh, plan, which is going to be delivered shortly. Um, I'll itemize some of those items, the uh, timeline, the table of organization, the budget, uh, the RFA phase two process, uh, which is not only the regulations but the actual uh, procedural aspects of it, and also, again, how that will integrate into the phase one uh, uh, qualification uh, steps. Uh, all of those areas are being prepared for uh, full discussion with the commission. And, uh, you know, as you all are aware, uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting with uh, individual commissioners and staff. Um, and Eileen, uh, as well as to go over with the project management consultants, uh, a lot of the detail that would set forth um, all of the uh, matters that are going to have to be addressed and relatively quickly. Yeah, things are moving ahead. Um, we also will be documenting the options and making recommendations around auditing, uh, the scope of the uh, minimum controls, rules of the game, gaming equipment, uh, memorandum of understanding with the various agencies, both that which is required under the statute and others which we think would uh, be uh, um, of great assistance for efficiency and memorialization of relationships. Uh, there will also be uh, probably a great deal of discussion about the regulatory versus the, the criminal enforcement. Jurisdictional issues are going to have to be uh, fully addressed, and we've had many of those discussions already, but there will be uh, many more in the future. We'll be finalizing the RFA Phase 1 Massachusetts Supplement Form. Uh, there are some specific legal issues we'll be discussing tomorrow in regard to some elements that we feel that uh, the statute requires, um, uh, one having to do with uh, full disclosure of uh, contributions and so forth that may relate to the local process. We want complete transparency, as the Commission has directed, and we think some additional uh, steps may be uh, required there. 
And finally, the uh, sections of the strategic plan itself. Um, that has been worked on all summer. And Fred, if you want to address anything in that. Um. Well, just from a uh, process point of view, things are coming together. Uh, these, each section of the report, you know, presents certain issues which we'll be reviewing with the commission and ultimately will be in the strategic plan for final action by the commission. Again, as a matter of process, we're looking to get a first draft together by around, on or about uh, September 10th, and then uh, have more substantive discussions uh, going forward, and the Commission ultimately will have some options in, in the report, and will make, a, hopefully, a determination as to which way it wants to go. Because just to take the issue of regulatory enforcement versus criminal enforcement, the decisions made there will have an impact on the table of organization. Uh, as we're going to discuss tomorrow, we have three options, uh, you know, for consideration, and there might be a hybrid ultimately decided by, uh, by the Commission in that regard. So each of these issues has an impact on how enforcement is going to be carried out. There's budgetary considerations with respect to each of these issues, and we'll be having those discussions. Uh, there's no right answer or wrong answer. Right. Different states and different uh, jurisdictions have approached these issues uh, differently. Uh, the variables are your statute, what's required under, under Massachusetts law. Uh, it's irrelevant what's required under other laws of other states. We have to apply what's, 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 what's in this law. To, to what extent does the strategic plan have to be completed before we can figure out um, uh, where the phase two regulations go? In other words, how, what, what's, the, what's the, the relationship between those two? Well, we've been working here on a, you know, a hybrid basis. Um, you know, in, uh, uh, the strategic plan will be a, a, a basic document and, and present a blueprint, but as, as you know, uh, we've accelerated the phase one process. Right. Uh, we're talking about other processes, so we're not letting uh, time elapse without moving forward on a number of things. So right. I think the way we've evolved it here has been a, a good process. It's allowed the Commission to move forward rather than waiting for the strategic right. plan to be completed and, and reviewed and adopted by the Commission. So that process in, in this jurisdiction seems to have worked very well. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, that's how we're looking at going forward. Yeah, the, the phase one process really worked uh, beautifully and, and uh, through your cooperation and, and the cooperation of the uh, legal consultants, Anderson and Krieger, I think we uh, did, a, did a terrific job collectively of getting that done. Um, and that is all out now, I should say. But it was all sent to the Secretary of State last Friday. It's going to be published on uh, uh, August 31st. The public hearing uh, will follow on September 10th, and so that phase, we're right on track to get that phase uh, uh, done, and, and the RFA uh, 1 applications issued by mid-October, as we said uh, some months ago we would. As I think about this in the abstract, and I'm sure this will unfold more as we move forward, <clears throat> the phase 2 regulations in a, in a number of ways are more complicated than the phase 1 regulations yes. are and more closely tie into, as you suggested, policy decisions and where we want to go with uh, the Commission's overall approach to the regulatory process. Right. So I, I take it we will be discussing at a fairly early stage the relationship between those two and how much of the strategic plan we have to have done before we can really begin to right. think about the full shape of the, of the RFA, too. And just from a timing perspective, um, <clears throat> from approximately um, October through early the first quarter of next year, we would anticipate those discussions taking place so that publication of these regulations. And we look at the phase two process as probably the most controversial process. In addition to everything that you've indicated, it has to be bulletproof. Uh, to withstand legal challenges. It has to be transparent. Um, in other jurisdictions, there's been a lot of legal suits that have been brought in the RFP process, the selection process. So it has to be a very um, uh, a process that will withstand the legal scrutiny, and it has to be implemented in a way that will withstand the legal scrutiny. Yeah. Which also includes, if I may, Commissioner, also includes uh, the clarification on, on the process you'll be following and making your decision. I mean, the standards exist, but the process itself, right. uh, 
uh, it requires an integration of, of both the phase one and phase two regulations and the compliance of the applicants. Right. Uh, we note that in the, uh, the phase two um, index, if you will, at this point, uh, there's a pretty good burden on the applicant uh, with compliance with uh, uh, various reports and surveys and findings and, and uh, things that they have to do to bring forward to you. And you do set that timetable. And, uh, you know, we've always been guided by the fact that we want to move as efficiently as possible but also as prudently as possible so that the maximum standards of integrity are uh, maintained. Uh, and we're following that through uh, right through the phase two uh, regulation drafting too. Is there going to be uh, room for discussion in this, in this uh, overall process <clears throat> as to what we can achieve by policies as opposed to regulations? Uh, it seems to me there's Absolutely. room for some policies. In no, there's here. no question about that. Um, everything doesn't have to be a regulation all the time, and, and there's obviously precedent in other, other jurisdictions, and that balance is something which will be uh, discussed. Uh, uh, do you need regulations on every aspect of casino control? Not necessarily. You need some broad regulations which empowers the commission, but you might want to have what we call minimum internal control standards, uh, which would be something other than regulations but commission policy, which would be implemented through the regulatory process. Therefore, if technology changes or if issues, you know, change, it's easier to change the minimum internal controls rather than go through changing a regulation, which take is time consuming. Yeah. Kind of yeah. that interplay. Right, the interplay between those two. Will there be um, uh, the, uh, will there be a third uh, a third regulation phase? The sort of yes. uh, operating. Regulations that that won't be part of the phase two, will it? It it it, it you know th there's an argument that it should be because you want to put the potential licensees on notice of what the regulatory process would be in this uh -huh. jurisdiction. Right. Uh, in our view, it's not mandatory, but if if it can be done over the course of the next nine months, it it would be reasonable to try to do that. And by, by that, I, I mean the kinds of things uh, uh, like, um, uh, like the, the, the regulations that govern what happens on the gaming room yes. floor, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that would be reasonable if we can do it to, to have in these phase two regulations right. as well. I don't think it's mandatory, but if, right. if we can get to that point or certainly have some of the broader regulations uh, in, in place on, on the minimum internal control standards that will be utilized in this jurisdiction, uh, the relationship to uh, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, right. uh, and the reporting of, of SARCs and, and currency transaction reports with the state as well so that the potential licensees are on notice of what their obligations will be in, in this jurisdiction. They appreciate that. I mean, yeah. because it affects obviously their staffing and their tables of organization. So, right, right. No, I, I agree. It would be enormously helpful to have it out there so that everybody could see exactly what they were getting into, and also to ensure that we're looking at an application that has the capacity to meet those requirements. Mm -hmm. Um, but that uh, also means uh, that there is. A, a <laughs> it's always a quid pro quo. Right. Right. <laughs> a lot of work. To answer your research. question originally, that, that it will be a blend though of regulation and policy. There are policies that you will have flexibility on in that to you know. In that area as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. 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 And and you want to preserve as much flexibility as possible because. Things change, technology right. changes, you know, right. all, all these, the use of an uh, outside gaming laboratory to do the testing of the slot machines, you know, uh, the use of technology, the standards for, for those testing. Right. I mean, the more that you can, we can put those things in place at an earlier date, you know, I think the better off everybody is. Right. Who called Patron's a slot machine? The state police have to be there. The security, you know, all of these right. basically uh, internal right. control type things. Are, right. We'll also have to have, uh, as we move forward, a number of additional MOUs with other entities, right? Isn't that well, both internally and, and for the purposes of the casino licensing investigations, uh, we would recommend collectively, right. would recommend uh, uh, entering into memos of understanding with some of the other jurisdictions uh, like Nevada, like New Jersey, um, oh, I hadn't thought of and, that. and Ohio, right. Right. because that will, um, that will potentially streamline the investigative process. 
uh, right. because of as you're constituted as a law enforcement agency, so uh, those types of memos would be very helpful in, in, in getting um, valuable information on an expedited basis. And mm -hmm. certainly, that's something we will we'll be discussing in the strategic plan, and something which can be, I think, readily implemented. We implemented. Uh, four or five MOUs for Ohio in a matter of six weeks. Great. Commissioner? Yeah, gentlemen, I had a question about uh, some jurisdictions moving forward with temporary regulations, and then later on, after um, uh, casinos were up and operating, going back and making them uh, permanent. Now, I know that we're not, up, we're not working in that direction, but could you just I, I've always been interested to why some jurisdictions choose to move in that direction. Okay. We, uh, well, uh, jurisdictions don't have uh, the time limit that temporary uh, regulations do in Massachusetts. I believe it's 90 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and we examined that early on um, for speed of the process. And it was determined that because of the uh, importance and, and the scope and the breadth of the uh, regulations that by the time we went through the implementation process, including um, you know public hearings and so forth, that most of the 90 days would be eaten up, uh, even for their enforcement. So mm -hmm. it would be better to simply move ahead with permanent regulations. It was examined. Now other jurisdictions don't have, say, 90 days. They can have temporaries for extended periods. But here it was uh, clearly in the best interest of the Commonwealth to have uh, permanents, uh, you know, go through the effort, make the effort once, and do it right. And, and we, I totally agree with that. And the other reason why some jurisdictions have gone the temporary route is if they're using a reconstructed building and the place is going to open in six to nine months, uh, there's a need to get something up and running rather than having the building sit empty for, you know, a, a period of time till the permanent regulations can be adapted. Here, I don't think that's as relevant because it's going to be primarily new construction, which is going to take X amount of time. And temporary licenses, too, for that yes. matter. That, that's not employee or so. Right. Well, one of the things we, we uh, can hope to do uh, over the next couple of days and then continuing is to draw on the experience of the first phase of the regulations, take a look at what worked, what was an impediment to progress, smooth that out, and, and try and, and build on on the successes that we had there for that piece of it. There's more, in the more to it. In the history of regulations, reason. that was a pretty quick process. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and uh, to the extent we can make it uh, even more smooth and quicker, um, we now's the time to think about uh, how to do that. Commissioner, any uh, questions or thoughts? Um, one quick question, and just correct me. I'm assuming kind of this third part of the regulatory process will get to the licensing and investigation of vendors, employees, everything else like that. So we're looking at that for the third phase. Um, I was with a group of uh, kind of workforce development people this morning down in the southeast region and obviously beginning to understand what those criteria are for employment in the casino gaming world. It's going to have a big impact as to a, a lot on, the, on how these workforce development groups function. But to know that's kind of coming in the third phase is yeah, so. absolutely. The employee licensing uh, implementation of, of the legislative uh, standards and the way we've worked in other jurisdictions, we, we've tried to have a series of meetings with all of these groups uh, so they understand clearly what the licensing requirements are so that someone who might have a felony conviction doesn't waste a lot of time going through the process and then that creates a high level of, of disappointment and, and whatever. So it's important to get the work force groups, the, the ultimate casino licensees, uh, human resource departments, and the commission on the same page to make sure that uh, the process, the licensing process, uh, functions in a way that will be efficient and it doesn't disappoint people who, it makes no sense to give them workforce training if they don't meet the licensing standards. Well, I, I also think you made the point. <coughs> minute ago about, you know, kind of people getting their expectations up and then also, you know, the provisions of gainful employment come down and for some reason, you know, somebody finds that they're outside of the, uh, outside of the opportunity. Right? Pre-employment -pre education is a, a very big concern and, and we think it's very important that, you know, anyone interested in getting into the industry understands that it's a special industry in terms of standards uh, and there's a lot of rules and so forth that don't apply in a lot of other industries that do in gaming and licensing is a privilege 
Um, but the good thing about it is you, you have standards, you know, that will be published and people right. will know. And we'll be right. in a position of the commission will provide guidance if there's people who, you know, aren't sure whether they qualify or they don't qualify. You know, there will be the ability to have dialogue and education and that. So uh, no one's time is wasted, but at the same time, you make the available opportunities as broad as you possibly can to assist in un unemployment. So that the third phase, just to pick up on Commissioner Stebbins' uh, uh, question, the third phase uh, would deal with such things as the uh, vendors and the employees and the Casino licensees. Yeah, uh, right. uh, there'd have to be some of that in place by the time construction started, though, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this whole process would would uh, have to be, um, well, at least include the, uh, what, whatever was necessary to get the construction phase okay. underway would have to be in place by the time the licenses were granted, right? Right. right. Yeah. And I think there's a number of, you know, models to follow. I mean, you right. remember in New Jersey when we had the construction companies brought in under the licensing process and, and that was a very, that was done because of necessity at the time, the issues right. that were raised and it was a very, um, unique thing at that point in time, but it's been adopted here right. as well in a number of other states. Right. Well, that illustrates how helpful this uh, process that uh, Director Glowski uh, talked about a minute ago is going to be to keep track of these things and look at dependencies and, and uh, do it graphically so that it's uh, easily uh, visible to everybody as to where we're going and what we need to have in place in order to get there. All right, that's very helpful. Thank you. No further Thank questions? You. To Thank tomorrow. you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, to the next item then technical and other assistance to communities. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, do you want to talk to that and, and perhaps fold into that the ombudsman search update? Uh, absolutely. We had. Um, uh, Continuing to obviously work with the uh, proposal that we received from the Collins Institute at UMass Boston about assistance to local communities. We had an inquiry uh, yesterday from a community with respect to uh, whether the Class B license, the slots parlor license, would involve the same local process as a Class A the resort license application. And, and of course, our reply back to the community is, is that it would. Um, and that prompted our conversation about, and, and I had a chance to speak with our uh, Director of Communications, uh, Driscoll, about maybe updating some of our frequently asked questions portion of, uh, of the Gaming Commission's website. Uh, quickly moving the Ombudsman search update, um, we have had uh, well over a dozen good candidates that we have talked to from for this position. Those interviews are ongoing uh, through uh, pretty much the end of this week, uh, potentially some additional follow-up next week, but uh, our hope is to obviously take that group of 12 and narrow it down to some finalists to uh, present to uh, Chairman Crosby for him to meet with as well. But good candidates, wide variety of background. As, as we've talked to these candidates, we've explained to them that uh, obviously uh, our commission is in a hiring mode, so we take the opportunity to talk to candidates about other interests they may have, other skills and background they may want to uh, share with us. So again, as, as I know our chief of staff is kind of building a, a pool of candidates for other opportunities as they become available. But we've used the, uh, uh, these interviews to solicit what, are the, what are, uh, other interests that they might have. So again, as we move down the line and one position morphs into new responsibilities and challenges that we have a good pool of candidates we can go directly to. Well, this is a this is the ombudsman uh, is a key position, and now that we're uh, beginning to uh, approach the application uh, uh, window, the opening of the application window, uh, uh, cities and towns I think will will be uh, eager to, uh, as well as the potential developers, will be eager eager to. Um, uh, make use of that person as soon as he or she is on board. Uh, uh, Chairman Crosby has uh, been acting and will continue to act as the ombudsman 
in a in a limited uh, capacity until the actual ombudsman is a board. Correct. And in fact, has already met with um, uh, two of the developers and arranged for them to have access to um, the Department of Transportation, which is one of the one of the uh, ombudsman's uh, roles. So. Um, uh, all uh, of the applicants who uh, pay the application fee are entitled to meet with the permit granting authorities and the ombudsman will facilitate that process. Everybody who's interested is entitled to one meeting, uh, but uh, once that application fee is uh, paid, then uh, multiple meetings are possible and Chairman Crosby, until we get the ombudsman aboard, is uh, the gatekeeper facilitator uh, for those meetings and has begun to do that with uh, a couple of the, de the um, uh, developers already, so we look forward to getting that ombudsperson on board. Uh, anything else on those topics? Okay. Uh, finance budget area. We have no finance budget reporter here today. Uh, the um, uh, finance budget uh, uh, results of our last meetings are posted on our website. That budget for the next year is in place and is the one we'll be using. Um, so we move then to item seven on the agenda, which is the uh, public education inf information. Um, let's hear from Director Driscoll uh, about events in that area. Hello. 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 I'll be quick because a lot of it is just the same follow-up from um, last week, but as Director Glovsky mentioned, um, our process is really moving forward for brand identity and website development. Um, I'm glad that we are on track to make a decision on September 4th. As I said, in the meantime, I've started developing content and um, basically a site map uh, for the website so that when the graphic designers do come on we can quickly move forward with a goal of um, a launch in mid-October to uh, hopefully be um, uh, basically simultaneous with the issue of phase one regulations that's the goal is to have that up and ready by the time phase one regulations are issued um, I'm also um, in the process of promoting the public comment uh, period on phase one regulations, making sure that on both social media and our press releases, we're aggressively reminding people um, that we are seeking public comment for phase one regulations. Um, simultaneously, I'm promoting the three public hearings that will occur um, on September 10th. Um, I'm also just uh, making sure that we're organized. We have um, at least um, a dozen speaking engagements in the next six weeks. Uh, so uh, there's a considerable amount across the state, as uh, many of you well know. And um, so I'm just making sure that we're organized and have the proper materials for that. And then, again, we're... If, the, the faster we move, obviously, the more media inquiries that start to come in. So just fielding uh, a large volume of media inquiries. In uh, future, we can't do it with the phase one regulations because we haven't tested it, but you had an interesting idea about um, uh, sort of a, a wiki approach to comments, mm -hmm. uh, which I think we will try out in some other way. Could you just spend a second explaining in general terms what that is? Sure. So uh, what I would like to see us do, uh, may hopefully for the next phase of regulations where we're seeking public comment, is utilize some online technology such as wiki shared pages, um, which is basically gives us the opportunity to um, share editing with the public. So, in other words, um, it offers the opportunity for the public to go right into the document and actually edit along with us. Um, it's pretty innovative. Not too many people do it right now, and um, I think that in terms of community engagement, it would um, be very positive for us uh, to, to take that step. In addition to the usual steps right. as well, it would simply be another avenue. I think it's a fascinating idea. I'd, I'd like to find a vehicle to uh, 
to try it on. Sure. Um, We're working that on that. Was not, so uh, before we get to that stage, so right. we test it and find out its limitations. But in terms of, of public participation and um, access, um, that uh, that's that's a terrific uh, uh, thing to explore. And even if we can't do it for regulations, um, uh, because of record keeping requirements, mm -hmm. which are pretty precise, uh, using it to help develop other and get uh, other regulations. Uh, I mean, not regulations, but sure. policies and the like. It, it's a it's a great way to solicit public participation. Yeah, some cities. Ha under similar public record laws have been able to find a way to do it, such as San Francisco. So I, I think that there is a way, but you're right, we have to make sure that it's properly vetted and, right. um, and that there's not a uh, margin for error. Right. So, um, but we're working on that. So hopefully the next time there's an appropriate opportunity, we'll use it. Yeah, great. great. The, other, the other thing I know um, that we're going to do here in the near future is update the frequently asked questions mm -hmm. piece to deal with some of these um, some of these issues that now are uh, being raised like the one uh, the, the request we got the other day and so that things are there for people to look at sure yeah that would be great so we've been trying to stay up on them as quickly as we can right. I mean the thing no, is, is that of, things change so quickly which is quickly. great but right. Um, so we just did a round of updates last week. Uh, so happy to add in um, the new questions. We're staying on the many questions that are coming in through MGC comments. Um, just actually completed that last week to make sure that there were no outstanding questions. Um, so anytime you get a question like that, maybe the process can simply be that you send it to me and, um, and I'll be sure to get it updated ASAP. I think that's an important thing for the public to understand, particularly those who are not here today but are watching on the on the um, on the web. Uh, we are uh, making an effort to respond to every one of those mm -hmm. questions that's sent to MGC comments. Uh, so if you have questions, you really should send them. And if you don't get an answer, if something falls through the cracks, send the question again. And and we because we really do take that very seriously and are trying to answer those questions uh, routinely. And I just want to say, too, similarly, we're making a point to answer them through Twitter and Facebook as well. So we have been getting some questions through Twitter that we address right away, too. Great. I noticed when I, I, I did look at our current list of published frequently asked questions, and, and the list is getting so extensive, I'm wondering if there's a way we can begin to categorize I think there the is. questions. Yeah. Um, because they're going to, I mean, they're dealing with a variety of different right. topics, but if I'm from the potential host community, where can I find those questions that might be particular to the host community or the slots parlor license questions, but kind of begin to see if we can categorize them in some way. We will. All right, Thanks. anything? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So. Uh, the next item is 7C, the discussion of the diversity inclusion forum. I can't add, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chairman Crosby is uh, really handling that and working uh, hard on the arrangements for that. But I can say that there is a new date uh, at the last meeting, I believe we said September 17 would be the day. Uh, that date has been changed to September 19 uh, with a location and uh, an agenda to come later. Uh, but September 19 is the date that is now the operative date. I don't, do we, do we have a location? Uh, no. So uh, we'll, of course, post that location when we get the, when we get the information. But uh, as a placeholder, September 19 is a date for that important uh, forum. Um, the research agenda is the eighth item on the agenda. And um, we've really covered that uh, through Director Glovsky's report. The RFI is in progress, will be issued, and then once we get the results from that, we will um, uh, move forward with, with uh, that uh, research agenda, which is both comprehensive and, and uh, detailed. Uh, and that brings us, I think, to the end, uh, not I think, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Uh, item 9 is reserved for matters the Chair did not reasonably anticipate, and I can think of none. 
Nor do I, else have any? Uh, I just, a, just a quick report. As I mentioned, I was down in Brockton this morning at Massasoit Community College. Uh, uh, the community colleges have taken this leadership role in workforce and casino career training. Uh, the folks gathered around the table were from workforce investment boards, one-stop career centers, regional employment boards, the other community colleges throughout that southeastern region, Region 3. And, uh, you know, they're all being driven to sign an MOU that they're willing to partner with each other and work together to uh, provide casino career training. Again, kind of incorporating the Atlantic Cape Community College in New Jersey's casino career uh, uh, curriculum. So, great meeting. I know the Western Mass region has had a meeting. This was the first meeting in Southeast, and I believe they're planning a, a meeting of the folks in the uh, Region 1, the kind of Boston region as well. So, thank the community colleges for their leadership. Yeah, it's a terrific thing to watch uh, come into, into uh, being. Is, is our role um, that of a Facilitator, observer, question answerer. answerer uh. There is, uh, there is a, 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 a at least a, a noted uh, section of the statute which talks about our ability to certify uh, a career training curriculum, um, and you know it's again kind of a, a small note in the statute, but one I think we ought to take seriously because I think we at the same time have a responsibility to protect Massachusetts residents who may hear about some online course or some other entity offering casino training, mm -hmm. which uh, usually winds up with them spending a lot of money and not really getting a, uh, any opportunity out of it. Um, so I think, you know, as, as uh, we move closer to the opening of these facilities, we may see entities pop up that don't have the best intentions in mind. But uh, we do have uh, some authority under the statute to certify a, a, a training program or a curriculum. Right. Uh, there was talk this morning about uh, the commission actually, uh, and I didn't have a chance to talk to the organizers of the meeting, but some uh, certification which would essentially be a certification from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission for an employee who, or a potential employee who completed the training curriculum. So I think there's a good way for us to be involved. Obviously, the thrust of the legislation was creating jobs for Massachusetts residents. So I don't think we want to be completely an innocent bystander, right. but we want to uh, uh, work with our partners. And, and certainly that includes the Executive Office of Workforce and Labor Development and all of these regional alliances and entities. And at the same time, help to ensure that those who are going to these courses, as you said, uh, are getting something of value out of them. Right. Uh, yeah. All right. Anything further? Nothing. All right. I have nothing further uh, either, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That's a record, all right. Commissioner. The meeting is uh, adjourned. And, uh, we thank you all for attending and watching. <laughs>